All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for, for coming. We're really excited to have uh, Professor Collins here for our uh, members member speaker series uh, for, for talks this week. So uh, Professor Christopher Collins is actually a Canada Research Chair in Linguistic Information Visualization and also an Associate Professor in Computer Science at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. Uh, his research is interdisciplinary, combining human-computer interaction, information visualization, and natural language processing. And he's done research sort of broadly in the area of information management and the challenges that arise from information overload. Uh, he has a pro prolific publication record, published over 50 papers, uh, many have won awards, and also in this, the top, top uh, tier of publication venues for for his research areas such as IEEE transactions on visualization and computer graphics. Uh, his work has appeared in popular media, media such as the Toronto Star and the New York Times Magazine and he's also alumni of the University of Toronto. He did his PhD in the Department of Computer Science here. So without further ado, let me, uh, help, let me welcome Professor Christopher Collins. Thanks very much, Toby. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be here, and I'm, I'm grateful that you called me a, a member of the, of the community here, even though I've never been to one of these talks, unfortunately. Um, my students do come, though. Uh, UOIT, if you don't know, we're out in Oshawa, and um, it's a bit of a commute for me when I'm teaching on Tuesdays, unfortunately. Uh, but I'm grateful to be here. Classes are over, so we need to work, and uh, hopefully in the future we can have teaching schedules so that I can attend more often. So, um, as Toby mentioned, you know, this is a sort of deja vu for me. I'm back. Uh, at U of T, this, this facility was actually just uh, opened right before I finished. And I also spent some, a significant amount of my graduate studies at the University of Calgary as well. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is the theme of research under my Canada Research Chair, the Linguistic Information Visualization. And that's the main um, piece of the research in my lab, so that's our main theme. Uh, we do work uh, broadly in visualization technique and analytic process design, so we're looking especially these days at mixed initiative analytics, things like um, how do we understand, uh, how do we visualize data models as well as raw data, so bringing together machine learning and visualization. Uh, we also have a theme of research around interaction design for visualization research, so touch, gesture, direct manipulation interfaces, and a series of applied visualization um, uh, stream of research around healthcare, security, software engineering, visualization, and those kind of things. But I'm going to stick today um, to keep it uh, to the theme of the talk, to the linguistic information visualization. And even for that, I want to specifically talk about the title a little bit. So what I'm interested in here is that uh, information visualization is not a tool for replacing our ability to, or our need to read texts, right? Uh, the main um, theme of my research is that we always have access to the underlying text, and I'm constantly motivating for that. And I, I'm happy to see changes over the years in our community towards <coughs> supplying those interactive linkages to the underlying texts. So Toby mentioned information overload. I just want to uh, start off with a few um, quotes about information overload. So in uh, 2010, with the amount of information online, it is very easy for people to drown in useless information that they do not need in business or in their lives. If you try to absorb all the information you can find online, you, then you experience social media overload. So sort of this kind of doom and gloom statement, great for a grant application, you know, motivates people that think this is a terrible thing, we need to fix it. And, um, but it's not new. We can go back 1967 famous Canadian, Marshall McLuhan. One of the effects of living with electric information is that we live habitually, oh, preview, foreshadowing, live habitually in a state of information overload. So he's coining the term information overload. There's always more than you can cope with. And we could go back even further than that, as you saw with the preview. This is really slow. As long as the centuries continue to unfold, the number of books will grow continually, and one can predict a time will come when it will be almost as difficult to learn anything from books as from the direct study of the whole universe. <laughs> it will be almost as convenient for, to search for some bit of truth concealed in nature as it will to find it in the immense multitude of bound volumes. And we can go back even further than this. So, people were a little bit dr more dramatic. We have a reason to fear that the multitude of books which grows every day in a prodigious fashion will make the following centuries fall into a state as barbarous as that of the century that followed the fall of the Roman Empire. So maybe this is what I need to put in my grant application. So what I would say is don't panic. People have been coming up with solutions as well as you know, stating the problem for many, many years. So there's some seats. I don't know if people want to come in. I'm fine with you just coming in and taking these if they're empty. 
Are they reserved or are they just there? Well, I don't know who's going to take them now. We're started, so. Yeah. <laughs> Reservation has expired. Yeah. Uh, utility of lexica comes not from reading it from beginning to end, which would be more tedious than useful, but from consulting it from time to time. And of course, this is the uh, genesis of things like a table of contents or an index so that we can uh, reference into documents. Also, uh, techniques such as cut and paste, so this is actually literally with scissors and glue, cutting and pasting to try and create organizations of information that are useful for somebody's task. As well as annotation, so the greatest secret is to make different types of uh, marks for different types of passages, so crosses, circles, half circles, numbers, letters, and other characters which had the various meanings one assigned to them. So this Charles Sorrell quote refers to, if you go up to the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library and look inside of the covers, you might find some manuscripts with markings on the inside cover. People were much more willing to write on their documents and make personalized notation uh, legends and keys for how they would uh, reference into those texts. <coughs> so the real problem not, is not and never has been the wealth of information. The problem is the lack of uh, appropriate tools for filtering, annotation, exploration, and collaboration. The pace of information dissemination exceeds the pace of tool and technique development and we're always catching up. And that's just me. So. <laughs> So the theme of research then is looking at abstract visualizations of information from text and documents, not something like this. This is very beautiful, uh, uh, Mountain Peaks of Prophecy by Larkin, the series of actually, uh, this comes from a series of visualizations of Bible texts um, that are more of a literal depiction of the story of a document. And what we're looking at instead, and this is from my work and others' works, are more abstract visualizations that represent something about the text in order to help people uh, achieve a particular task. So what kind of, uh, why is language data important? So first of all, uh, there's a whole theme of research within the digital humanities. We're looking at culture and society, understanding culture and society. Of course, from the business point of view, people are looking at what are people saying about my brand? What are people saying about uh, are my product? You know, hotel reviews, those kind of things. Uh, public policy analysis, so looking at uh, consulting with citizens and understanding what people are saying about particular policy uh, directions. Internal reports, communications, the university looking at internal um, documents, as well as legal studies, so document discovery, um, what do we do when we have an entire document database and we've got to give some of them to the other side in a court case, but well, we need to figure out which ones are the ones that are important. You may be familiar with traditional, I would say traditional text uh, visualization techniques like this. So what are the main words that you saw on that screen? Sleep. Bear, 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 sleep, sleep yeah. So what is the document? A fairy tale. Fairy tale. Goldilocks. Goldilocks and the Three Bears, yeah. Of course, no, that's a trick question, it's not. Um, this is uh, to be or not to be, so the opening frame is <laughs> not this uh, nunnery scene soliloquy in, in Shakespeare's Hamlet. So my point here, and this is uh, thanks to Marty Person's example, is that when we take these uh, texts and take them apart and just you know splat the words on the screen in an in a out-of-context way, they're not really a replacement for reading. So what are we doing here then? What we're looking at is how do we go from a visualization at one level of uh, text data uh, size and use the visualization to help us reference into a, uh, a smaller size. So I put together this sort of hierarchy of the size of the data that we might deal with and we might go from, oh and then of course we also have metadata, so the author, the date it was made, those kind of things, even things like the way it's rendered on a page, so uh, the medium, um, then visualization can help us go from one level to another. So we can go from a document collection to a specific document by using a visualization of the document collection to help us find the one that's important to us. So throughout the talk, I'm going to go through some examples that um, follow these different arrows. So first of all, let's look at document collection to a document. And actually, this project was in collaboration and led by uh, Jian Cao, who's a former PhD student from this group. Um, and uh, he and I have had uh, many years of collaboration. Um, so this is uh, from his thesis research. So here we were looking at uh, spreading of anomalous information in, uh, in Twitter. And in particular, we were interested in misinformation on Twitter or things that might be rumors. Uh, this is sort of timely because then, of course, fake news became a big thing. So we're looking at uh, unusual retweeting patterns, unusual lexical patterns in Twitter. And the motivation from this comes from real examples of rumors being spread on Twitter that weren't actually true during specific uh, world events such as the London riots in 2011. So in this project um, with collaboration with uh, uh, Yale Song and others who are in machine learning, we were interested in how do we create a human in the loop system that will use both machine learning and visual analytics to help us triage a large number of tweets in order to come up with a list that might be useful for somebody to look at in detail. 
So there's a bunch of different um, modules here. Uh, in particular, uh, the analysis section was done by our colleagues at Yahoo and uh, University of Pittsburgh, and they were interested in how do we analyze the um, tweets that we're gathering from a machine learning point of view, and then Gian and I worked on the visualization side. So what we're looking at in the back end here is, uh, as I mentioned, Yale Song's um, one class condition ra conditional random fields classifier. And in particular, what we're doing here is we don't have any uh, ground truth data for this problem. We're looking for tweets that are unusual. And they may be unusual for various different reasons. So one of the biggest parts of this project was to come up with a feature set that would be useful for detecting unusual tweets. Um, so the one class nature means that we only have uh, the, the tweets and what we're looking for are things that are outside of the um, norm there. We also have a high time dependency and this algorithm does account for that. So uh, one of the, the, the main parts of the early part of the research was to come up with a list of input features. So we used a series of different types of features, so user profile features, who is the person, what, is, what do we know about them, um, their network features, so who are they connected to. Uh, in particular, one of the things that I liked was the tweet content features, so things like emotional keywords, but also the linkage between the tweet content and the <coughs> user. So are these words that somebody is tweeting that they don't normally tweet? Maybe that's something that's important for us to know. So we're able to come up with, uh, you know, these features can capture things like threads expressing unnormal, uh, unusual temporal patterns, so user volumes, or things where many people don't usually retweet one another, or things where a lot of people are tweeting something that they don't normally tweet in terms of the content. So uh, what we're doing here then is we have what are called retweet threads. So this is one tweet retweeted thousands of times, and what we're interested in is, in bulk, what is the overall unusual pattern of this tweet? Uh, retweet thread. So we've got a time vector of the feature set of the 239 features and we can classify each of the uh, retweet incidences uh, according to its anomaly score. Of course we also have, uh, given the nature of the model, we have some hidden states which may be useful for somebody who's diagnosing or tuning the model to see. So this is what the visualization looks like and um, in this retweet graph we have a glyph that represents the amount of time that the tweet was active so the starting time and the ending time in a kind of clock metaphor, where the entire clock represents the time period where we've collected the data, so the event. Uh, we've got a sentiment score that comes from a sentiment tagging of the, of the actual text. And then an overall anomaly score. But we also have anomaly scores for the individual retweet instances. So across this graph, every circle is a retweet, and the size of the circle is how many people is it reaching. The more purple it gets, the more unusual or anomalous this tweet is. So we can see over this particular uh, tweet, as we go through time, it starts, the algorithm starts to detect this as being more and more um, uh, unusual. So the ideal situation would be if we can develop a model, and this is sort of future work, which would push this anomaly detection closer and closer to the time of the original tweet. So there's a couple of examples. So here uh, on the top, a lower anomaly score with a negative sentiment and a longer time period, uh, but an overall lower volume. On the bottom, a higher volume, um, more higher anomaly score and a sort of neutral sentiment. So you can try this out, actually. It's still up on the, on, running on Gion's website uh, if you want to play around with the visualization. So the interpretation of this visualization comes in four different kind of modes on the view. So first of all, uh, if the, the main way to look at this... Stop. <coughs> there we go. Uh, sorry, the, one of the mechanisms for looking at this is actually clustering the tweets based on their similarity in the feature space. So this is a multidimensional scaling view that will show you, if you find a tweet of interest, you can look in that region to see other tweets that might be related to it. Secondly, we have the same um, measure of tweet similarity, but we use hierarchical clustering to look at, uh, you can now view like a branch that contains all the tweets about a particular topic. And uh, you already saw the tweet thread view. And then there's a ser series of different diagnostic tools that might be useful for somebody who, again, is tuning the model or has more expertise in this area to look at the hidden states and the feature vectors uh, in, in detail. And then, of course, as the motivation of the talk is, you want to be able to read the original tweets um, as well. Finally, we have uh, overlaid some of the interaction information. Sorry, my laptop is being unusually weird today. So. Uh, overlay the network information so that we can see who, who is linked with who and what's the density of this um, sort of uh, social network. So to evaluate this, we ran a study where we looked at 
two different Twitter feeds. So we captured um, tweets from two different events, 52 million tweets from Hurricane Sandy and 242 million tweets from Boston Marathon bombing. And um, in this case, we classified them using two different techniques. And we took the, ground, the top 500 abnormal threads as ranked by the models and had three annotators uh, read through all 500 and rank whether or not they were correctly um, identified as being not true or, ran, or rumors. So one thing you can see here is, well, for, and then we did a spot check and we looked at uh, the top 3,000 tweets and we found that randomly choosing, uh, randomly choosing 3,000 tweets, only one out of 3,000 was considered to be incorrect or a rumor. Uh, so the random guess chance is less than 1% for us uh, in terms of uh, accuracy. So the accuracy made numbers can make him come across as low, but the uh, um, uh, comparator in terms of the baseline is much lower. But even that, I would argue that, uh, so here in the top 20, for example, in the Boston bombing, our algorithm was able to achieve about a 20% precision, um, whereas the uh, competing algorithm was much lower, but both are low. And what I think this um, uh, brings to mind for me is the need for systems like this to facilitate triage of this kind of large amounts of information. So we're able to get so far with the analytics uh, in the back end, and then the front end comes to play because now we have a quick way for somebody to diagnose and make decisions about uh, why the algorithm might be thinking that something's unusual and, and make a decision about whether it really is or not, and so is it in or out. So by facilitating that, we can go from, you know, we can um, eliminate a lot of the false uh, positives that are detected by the algorithm. Okay, so in another project looking at a similar kind of uh, topic of going from document collections to documents, uh, PhD or master student in my group, uh, Daniel Chang, uh, looked at 600,000 car accident reports. And in this project, he was looking at how do we turn these car accident reports around and sort of look at them as the vehicles themselves. So taking text visualization and applying it back to the physical objects that it's describing. So there are a few steps at the back end of the process for this. So um, First of all, we created an ontology of car parts uh, using Wikipedia and WordNet and a few other resources to try to bootstrap uh, this collection of uh, keywords. And uh, we had a manual step where we did some adjustments on it because our automatic uh, ontology generation detected some things that might be misrecognized as being car parts. So first, second, and third are gears, and they're important, but they're also things that happen in car accident reports. People say, first this happened, then this happened, third this happened, and those are not actually, shouldn't be recognized as car parts. Um, so, uh, we have statements like this. These car accident reports are car accidents that cause an injury or a death. They're man mandatory reporting in the United States, and uh, man car manufacturers are reading them. So they have people, staff people who are reading every single one of them that relate to their vehicle because they're a key thing that's used to determine the incidence of uh, accidents related to things that might need a recall. So there's a business case for a visualization like this. Um, so we count the number of times particular terms occur, and then we created a document database that we can reference into for the visualization. So in this case, we use a kind of uh, rendering that will uh, create the car parts as being more opaque and, and uh, more red if they're a higher score, and then more ghostly or outline if they're no, not appearing in the, do in the documents at all. So this is a sort of rich visualization dashboard now that allows for exploration of the document data set, but as well as the metadata about the vehicles that are stored in the data set. So here we have uh, the main view of the car uh, associated with a lens, which then shows the labels of the items that are inside of that lens. And you'll see here that there are these little heat map visualizations, and they reflect that the occurrence of those terms over time in, in the selected time period. Of course, going with the theme of the talk, the ability to read the actual documents that match the selections on the other widgets on the screen, and then the ability to drill down into a certain make or model and year of a car and particular time period of accident reports. And this was deployed on a uh, large touchscreen display or medium size these days, I guess. And uh, we looked at car buying decisions as they might be motivated by safety considerations. So. Um, Here's just a brief video. The, the lens uh, in operation allows you to see what's inside of the, the lens in terms of the details because there are too many car parts to label. You can also see that there are more things underneath uh, that you can sort of page down. Or you can actually uh, change the size of the lens or use the lens to cut away the vehicle to see what's inside um, by spinning that uh, handle uh, to cut into the vehicle um, depth. So we saw things that we expected, of course. So, um, 
for example, here, uh, you might remember that the um, Toyota uh, cars uh, in the early uh, 2010s and, and late 2000s um, had uh, a problem with un uncontrolled acceleration. And people were complaining about accelerator pedal brakes uh, within, within that vehicle. It was a huge outlier. In fact, most of the reports during this time period uh, are related specifically to only Toyota vehicles. We can apply this to other types of data sets. So for example, um, we might take this and turn it into a 3D rendering of a hotel room. And we could see, uh, kind of like walk through and see like what are people saying about our hotel room. Um, in terms of the, the bed's too hard, the shower's too cold, the, you know, the uh, curtains didn't make the room dark enough. Whatever it happens to be, we could note this. One of the things that I think we could probably um, improve on if we went forward with this is the, is the language processing side. So these are car accident reports, and we make the assumption that if a, if a part of a car is mentioned, then it's a negative mention because it's an accident report. But of course, that's not true. We have actually found incidences where the seatbelt failed, and the person flew out of the car and died. And we have incidences where the seatbelt worked, and it saved the person's life, and they're both mentioned in the car accident report. So we would need to disambiguate those in order to make this a better application. So um, we did sort of, because uh, we were focused on the technique design for the visualization, we didn't really focus on the language processing piece in this particular project. But it's something that we have ideas about how we might improve. <coughs> OK. So um, moving on, I want to talk about a project that uh, it's a bit older. It's actually one that I did myself. Uh, but. Uh, not that I don't do any work anymore, but a lot of it's my grad students. Um, but this one, uh, I want to mention it because it fits the theme of the talk, but also it, uh, it has had some long-lasting um, sort of traction within our community. Uh, so it's called Parallel Tag Clouds. And what we were interested in in this particular case was how do we analyze, and we were working with people at the Berkman Center of Harvard uh, Law School, how do we analyze thousands and thousands of court decisions to try and understand differences between the US federal courts. So if you're not familiar with the US federal court system, there are a series of roughly geographically associated entities uh, that are used for um, uh, higher level cases, appeals, those kind of things. So they're federal court um, districts. We had a collection of all of the decisions of the uh, courts over their entire uh, history of existence. and. Um, these were sort of roughly annotated as XML documents, but not really very well. And we wanted to extract the text of the original decisions. And what our colleagues were interested in from a legal scholarship point of view was the question of what's called forum shopping. So if you're a company like um, a multinational company or a national company like IBM or Microsoft or any of those companies that has offices across the country in the United States, if you want to bring a court case, you can actually bring it in whatever district you think might be more favorable to you because you have a presence in that district so you can bring your case there. So the question is, are there certain types of cases then that are being brought in particular districts because they um, might be more favorable or seen as being more favorable? So it's called forum shopping. Some things are known. So for example, publishing companies um, are, are based in New York, so there's a lot of copyright related law, uh, legal cases in New York State. But other than that, we were, they were interested in looking around and seeing what was going on. So here we had a text analysis infrastructure which detected and separated the different parts of the text. So we could take away the, the name of the justice, the name of the case, the dates, those kind of things, um, and find the actual text of the decision. We applied some simple NLP techniques and uh, pre-processed the expectation statistics. And I'll talk about what I mean by expectation statistics. So if you simply count the number of words in a document, you can get something like this. So these are you know, all the collective works of Shakespeare, and we get these words uh, as being highly occurring. In Macbeth, they're exactly the same list of words. But if we use an expectation statistic, like the Dunning Law of Likelihood, which we used in this particular uh, project, we might see that Macbeth has a very different set of words. And these are the words that make Macbeth different from the rest of Shakespeare as a reference. So uh, what we did in this particular case, then, was take each court district and use the, all the other court districts as the reference and find the words that are highly occurring in this court compared to the others um, to try and find uh, not just what's common, but what's unusually common. Interestingly, the significance measure also gives us what's unusually uncommon as well, although uh, that was uh, harder to visualize. So the visualization design follows the kind of familiar approach of a tag cloud, um, but now we have the terms organized alphabetically to support search. Um, 
as well as also to support density of the layout, because if we ordered them from smallest to largest, we'd have all the large things at the bottom across all the columns, and it would have to be spaced out more. Um, and in the first uh, go of this, we saw things like this. So we have Vermont, Kears, different kinds of names basically are coming up. And this was a bit of a, a sanity check for us because it shows that it's, that measure is actually working. This is not, this is what we would expect, right? Uh, that these are the names of the judges, the names of the states, and these are the most unusual things given the other court districts as a reference. So we took those out, and then we ended up with something that was a lot more interesting in terms of the terminology of what might be of interest to the legal scholars we were working with. So here, uh, racketeering, uh, narcotics, uh, trademarks, all in the second circuit. <coughs> so when words occur in multiple columns, we connect them across the columns with these edge stubs that we have as a hint, but then make available on a hover. And um, in this video, we'll show just how that exploration might work. So sorry for the quality of video, it's pretty old. Um, so here, uh, selecting certain terms on the view, we can actually use this to drill down into the uh, visualization and select cases. So um, the rich tooltip here shows you the score of the term across all of the court districts, but its occurrence in a particular column means it's significantly high for that column in, in, in particular. So by selecting these terms, we're now seeing uh, a list of the cases over time uh, that occur with these terms, and we can see the occurrence of those terms in the documents. And we can um, hover on that to see specifically, um, maybe that case might be of interest, but we can get a hint about whether it is or not. So if I hover on the bar for the term long, I can see some examples of occurrences of that term in reference documents. And if I click it now, I can read the actual case text uh, directly. So, we had some interesting outcomes for this. So one was uh, uh, Canadian reference, actually. So Conrad Black's case um, from the Seventh Circuit. When we, when we were looking at this, we saw the word ostrich in the column for the Seventh Circuit quite large. And we were wondering, why is the word ostrich appearing there? And I didn't know. Like I was thinking, oh, maybe there's an ostrich farm or something like that. But it turns out it's a type of instruction that's used. And our colleagues in the legal department knew right away. It's, a, it's an instruction that's used to, for juries to tell them um, just because the accused doesn't know what they did was a crime doesn't mean that they're not guilty. So they can't put their head in the sand and ignore that something is happening. And that was actually used in the Seventh Circuit case of Conrad Black. So what was of interest then, then and for our uh, colleague was to go and read why is this being used, or actually contact maybe even the Seventh Circuit and say what's going on, like why is this unusually instruction being used unusually? within your court. So um, you know, these kind of legal instructions should be used sort of uniformly across the United States. So if there's certain kinds of instructions that are being given to race um, in a different ratio in a particular court district, that might be of concern. So um, sort of an unexpected, unintended consequence of, of the research. We also found things, so I feel a bit like a weather person. So we found here in the Northwest, <laughs> uh, methamphetamine was appearing more frequently in the circuit courts where I lived to that. And over in the Northeast, we had uh, cocaine and, and crack cocaine. <laughs> so uh, drilling down even further then, uh, Tovi mentioned uh, the work that we did with the New York Times Magazine. That's this project. So looking at going from document collections all the way down to multi-word collocates. And in this particular case, the document collection that we were dealing with was passwords. So we were looking at millions of released passwords uh, that have been hacked and released online. And why were we looking at passwords? Well, there's a couple of reasons. So first of all, passwords are really evocative. They say something about the person that wrote them. This is a real password from our data set. And it makes me wonder, like, who is this person? Like, I'm a computer scientist, but I'm interested in people, right? So this person chooses a password, and they're typing it every day, or they're typing it multiple times a day. It's really sort of bad. Um, we have a lot of these, right? A lot of these passwords oh. that, oh, that person. have a sociolinguistic interest. Outside of a sociolinguistic interest, we also have an incredible security uh, vulnerability here by learning patterns of words in passwords. So the traditional way to learn a pattern and a password is what letters are more commonly going together. So um, in the past, uh, that was, you know, it works really well, but what we did here was we looked at what kinds of words go together. So breaking it up into constituent words and then looking at the semantic categorization of those words and thinking about what word categories 
making a, what we call the semantic grammar of passwords. So we had uh, the security piece as well as the society and culture piece. The security piece actually landed us a really uh, nice paper in the NDSS forum. I was surprised about that, but happily surprised. Uh, it's one of the most uh, prestigious venues. It's got an 18% acceptance rate for um, computer security. So, um, and, and at the time, uh, the password guessing algorithm we created based on this was uh, the top on several measures uh, available. So these are the types of things that we were able to detect. So we had password components that look like this, and we break it up into the individual components, and then we um, categorize those based on the type of word that it is. So um, uh, nine is a type of number, pitcher is a type of athlete, ring is a type of structure, etc. So we created a password guessing system then that took that model that we learned and reversed it to create guesses to try and um, uh, break passwords. Why is that of interest? Well, of course, we're not in the business of breaking into systems, but if we're figuring it out and knowing how to do it, then we can guarantee that lots of other people may be doing the same, but not making their knowledge public. So in, in order to create better security, we need to know the vulnerabilities. From the sociolinguistic piece of point of view, we had some also interesting findings. So this is a graphic that shows the top words in passwords compared to the top words in um, regular everyday English in the blue lines here. And one of the things you'll see right away is that there's an inversion, right? So um, things that are very common in passwords are less common in everyday English. Uh, and in particular, the, most, the second most common word uh, in terms, the second most different word from everyday English is the word love. So the first one is actually I. Um, so people use the word love in their passwords much, much, much more commonly than would be expected given everyday English as a reference. So we use the corpus of contemporary American English, which is a genre nonspecific, huge corpus of English, as a reference. And this is the same measure you saw in the parallel tag cloud, so the expectation measure. So it's sort of nice, I guess. Um, you know, people are using love in their passwords, uh, but it also is a real vulnerability. So you shouldn't use love in your passwords. <laughs> um, in fact, especially not if you're going to pair it up with a male name. So we used U.S. Census information to try and do some rough gender assignments kind of to names, although it's you know, obviously uh, uh, questionable using that kind of method. But um, anyway, the data is what it is, so we tried. And we found that uh, with male assigned names, we had I love four times more commonly than with female names. Um, we also found um, patterns that go along with that. So animals, like cute animals, are much more common. So monkey was the most common name, or common animal occurring in passwords. <laughs> Uh, and also, the interesting thing here that, uh, m from my colleague's point of view, Julie Thorpe, who's in security, was that profanity was so, so huge. And I mean, I guess I'm not, I'm not that I have profanity in my password, but I wasn't super surprised at that. But, uh, and this, this actually held across multiple collections of data. So we had passwords from gaming websites, passwords from Yahoo, passwords from um, LinkedIn. So these are like professional or, you know, passwords that uh, people are using profanity in. And why is this surprising? Well, there are lots of experiments where people bring people into the um, lab and they say, You're, you know, please make a password. What you do here is not going to be associated with your identity in any way. Just you know, make your password and goodbye. Here's $5. You know, thank you for your participation. Or even in a crowdsourcing study where people are making passwords. The, I, I guess our hypothesis is that even in those environments where people are guaranteed that what they're doing is not going to be associated with their identity, they're still hesitant to use what might feel natural to them in terms of profanity. But when we have this sort of naturalistic observation of passwords that are really released, we see it much more commonly. So that might be one of the reasons why our guessing algorithm is able to um, out, outperform. Um, we were able to use other techniques that we've developed in the lab. So here I'll talk to you a few minutes about this project. Um, looking at the types of animal pass animal words that occur more commonly in passwords. So people talked about fish and dolphins and I think jays might be uh, sports, uh, butterflies, and then this is a synonym for a shorter word. Uh, that's why it's showing up there. So this had, as, as I mentioned, a couple of different um, levels of interest from the media, but it also had some interesting scholarly contributions. We expanded this work to look also at the number patterns in passwords. Anybody know what 14344 four means? There must be some millennials in the room who know what this is. Yeah? I love you very much. Thank you. So I had no idea either. We were thinking it was the 14th of March, 1944. But it's actually, I love you very much. It's the number of letters in the, uh, in the words. 
So here we go again. Number patterns and passwords. What we were particularly interested in was, was dates. Uh, and what we found was the most common things were people who were lazy and using repeated sequences and people who were saying, I love you very much. <laughs> um, outside of that, though, you can see here on the top view of the calendar, uh, this is uh, January 1st to December 31st, and the darker the blue, the more commonly um, that date was used in a password. Uh, there's a lot of variety, but we do see things like uh, um, holidays are outstanding, so Valentine's Day, Christmas Day, Halloween. Um, we also had some interesting ones like 9-11, uh, uh, um, so 9-11 here, Twin Towers uh, uh, showing up uh, as well. And then here on this view, we have the decades of the year, uh, decades of the century, as well as the every individual year. And you can see that the more commonly occurring um, decades are from the 90s onward. And of course, we think this is the birthdays of people who are either making passwords or making passwords from their friends' and family's birthdays. Um, we also found interesting things like uh, 90210 is not a very good password to use. So people from my generation might be using that one. Um, so. Uh, uh, this is available, you can play with this on our website and explore the data for yourself. So I mentioned um, DocuBurst. So in this project we were looking at, I don't know why there's a weird X there. Um, we were looking at uh, how do we understand the inner, inner contents of a single document, so one document in detail, and this might be a very long document. Um, in this case we were uh, taking a, a document, taking, extracting all of the nouns, um, looking at, or all of the words, sorry, we looked at the nouns in particular, but uh, stemming the words, putting them into a structure called WordNet, and looking at how that structure reflects the contents of the text. So here, the way to read this is that from the middle outward, you get more specific, and the brightness of the green is how frequently that particular category of term occurs in the book of interest. And I'll show you some specific examples that might get um, more... Uh, that, that, give, that tell you a little bit more about how it works in a few minutes. So this was a very early project of mine, but we've been continuing to develop along this um, theme of research. And one paper we had a couple of years ago was looking at um, what we called uneven tree cuts, uh, inspired by information theory and the minimum descri description length principle. How could we decide upon a level of abstraction of a visualization that could be automatically determined to show important information and hide the clutter? So it's more of a general uh, information visualization contribution. So here, remembering that dark green is important, means it's occurring a lot in the document. This is the traditional way to explore a graphic like this. We go from three levels of depth to four levels of depth to five levels of depth, and eventually at six levels of depth, we start seeing some things that are really important. This is a gaming-related um, book. When we use our approach, which uh, hides information in branches that have a uniform, dis the, the main intuition is that if it has a uniform distribution, we say, we'll just cut it off. So if there are dog-related words, and there's poodle, and collie, and labrador, and all these different dogs, and they're all similarly occurring, we just chop it off and call it dog. But if it's only poodle and no other dogs, we go down and say poodle. So it's a way of sort of looking at the information entropy to try and decide how much we're going to reveal. So our first view looks like this. Second level of uh, drill down, we already have all of the interesting words that were on the original. Um, view, but overall much less information and much less clutter. If we expand out to a full view, we have now uh, a lot of, we have all the way out to storyline story here in terms of depth. Uh, I think this is 12 levels of depth, and then we've never even seen that one here in this version. So we have fewer nodes overall, but more information um, provided. I say this with a bit of a caution from an information <coughs> visualization sort of theory point of view. We've now got an algorithm deciding what it is that we're going to see. Um, and I think that's a positive advantage in this particular case, but we also want to make sure that people are aware that there's information that's been elided or removed from this view, um, so we're working on different kinds of hints that would show, you know, this is where information has been removed from the view. And we've applied this algorithm to other types of visualizations, so for example, tree maps as well. So for a funny case study, anybody remember this? Uh, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Um, there was a terrible book, apology, not even apologies, we don't deserve apologies. So there was a book that was uh, called Barbie Becomes a Computer Engineer. And it was like Barbie couldn't do actually anything without asking her male friends to help her. So it was just like an absolutely terrible reflection of uh, Barbie's capabilities as a computer engineer. This is a parody called Feminist Hacker Barbie. Um, and the reason I'm showing it is because we actually managed to get 
the script of everything a new Barbie doll called Hello Barbie can say. So um, because of the controversy around this uh, um, you know, Barbie doll that can talk to children, Mattel, uh, to their credit, released the entire script of everything that the doll can say so that parents and, and, and people could in examine it. So we decided we would examine it using this tool. So here we have loaded into the, our document here is everything that's in the 70,000 um, line script. And we're looking at the types of things that this um, doll can say. So first of all, uh, we're going to turn on that uneven um, view. So we get uh, exposed exposure of some of the interesting things that might be deeper in the tree um, automatically. So we can see she's talking about her friends. She's talking about fun, um, her parents, and th uh, um, See so here, veterinarian is exposed as a type of doctor because that's a really unusually highly occurring term in this data set. <laughs> so uh, if we drill down and look at um, cognition-related words, uh, by double-clicking here, it's going to reload the, the graph centered on, on cognition. We see some interesting things popping out right away. So um, fashion is a huge outlier. And we can actually, here on the on the view, we can see specific instances of where she says fashion. And if we want to read them in context, we can actually look at them here as well. So she's always trying to change the conversation back to fashion. Let's talk about fashion. What about fashion? That's interesting, but let's talk about fashion. Why? <laughs> if we drill down, we can start to see the types of things she talks about. So here with relation to science. So she does mention physics three times. Um, but then she says, I like chemistry. Uh, <laughs> she's not a big fan of physics. Um, and then if we drill down, she's, there's a few instances of math. Um, she says math's hard, uh, but also uh, congratulates the student if they say they're good at math. So there's, you know, there's both sides. Um, and if I also search now and look at color-related terms, we can see that the only colors she mentions are red and green with reference to Christmas, and everything else is pink. <laughs> Those are the only terms that occur in the entire script. So, we can also look at person-related terms. Um, so here, uh, as I mentioned, veterinarian is a bit of an outlier in terms of um, persons uh, and careers. Uh, but if we drill down really, really far, oh, princess, of course, is an another person-related term that's very common in this data set. Um, what's your princess costume? Do you make a princess cake? Do you wish you were a princess? Um, Biologist is much smaller than princess. <laughs> Even smaller than that, just wait, just wait for it. Engineer. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, there's a little bit of um, work to do, I think, on, uh, on encouraging uh, owners of Barbie dolls to have diversity in terms of their careers. One of the um, things I think that is, that sort of surprised me here was my own bias that I brought to the, to the analysis. So. Uh, when I saw, for example, the word shopping and how frequently and common the word shopping was, I was like, all they want to do is commercialize these poor children and make them shopping. But then when I actually read the data, I started to see that what they were actually talking about was your parents own a pet shop, your parents own a flower shop. You can see here the script is repeated, actually. So it just has the same script over and over for the different types of shops that the children's parents might own so that it can talk appropriately with them about their parents' occupation. Um, also, they've acknowledged kind of cultural diversity here. So she's talking about actually Diwali lamps and reindeers and Hanukkah menorahs. So she's got you know a lot of different things she can say about cultural events. And in fact, she even mentions Ada Lovelace. So, uh, so they sort of redeem themselves a little bit. Um, so if you want to play around with this, um, it's available online. You can upload your own documents. Just be aware that the documents you upload are not considered private. So you can uh, you know don't upload anything that you don't want to be shared. Um, okay, uh, we're running quick on time, but I want to finish off a couple of examples. I'm actually um, going to skip that and just tell you about it. Uh, so this is a bit of a playful project that's a, currently a work in progress. And uh, we're about to launch this in a study with uh, people who do creative writing, either as a hobby or as a career. What we're interested in exploring here is the relationship between documents or words and the colors that they might evoke. And um, this is coming from a data set from a crowdsource study that our colleagues at the National Research Council in Ottawa did, where they created an association between words and colors by um, asking 12,000 microtask workers on Amazon Mechanical Turk to choose an association that's appropriate for a color and a word. Um, 
And uh, we have a few different views. So we've got the editor view. Oh, what just happened there? That's where I never used PowerPoint before. But it's being really strange today. I'm sorry. Now I've got a spinning circle and I can't. So uh, we've got an editor view where you can look at the associations that come from the uh, data set with the words that you're interested in. We've got a view of every different color and the agreement between participants in the study about what they thought the color association was. So everybody agrees that cowardly is yellow, but only 7 out of 10 people agreed that sunshine was yellow. You can explore based on the topics in the language. So this is an organization based on the semantics, based on Roche's thesaurus this time. This is not words relating to plants and grass and nature. It's actually words relating to money and jealousy and things like that. So uh, words of um, uh, ownership and envy. Uh, and this comes from, this also reminds us, I think, about the cultural context of the study in which we did this. So this is contemporary understanding about the meaning of words from an American cultural point of view, which is why we get money as a, as a, as a green. Um, these are um, love-related terms, though. So uh, and all the nature stuff really comes out as brown. Um, the water, water is in... Uh, here. So water, ocean, lake, those kind of things. So you can edit uh, your document using this as a reference. Like I said, it's a kind of a few different application areas. So this one is kind of like a marketing. Um, so cynically speaking, like marketers, they really want every single word to count. And like you have to choose it very carefully. What is it going to evoke for your customers? This is the Coca-Cola brand statement. And the word refresh for the participants in our study actually made them think of blue. So maybe they could change it to a synonym like invigorate, which is actually more red. So uh, word substitutions that might be more appropriate. We've got a couple other projects in progress where we're looking at this kind of data analytics on a low level scale. So in this case, we're looking at mapping locations in a text to try and see um, where do uh, characters occur. Sorry, the light gray background's washed out. But where do characters uh, uh, and scenes take place in a text so we can map the travels of characters across um, time, uh, narrative time and space in a text. Um, and in this case, we're trying, the, one of the biggest problems is trying to disambiguate location names. So if a location is London, which, which London is it? Uh, in this case, we're using some clustering, population heuristics, but I think a better way to do this and what we're working with now um, is uh, some colleagues at Inria in France to try and use machine learning to better determine the locations that are, in, that are incorrectly tagged. The final project I just want to tell you about in closing is one that's actually coming out um, in the next issue of Tokai. It'll be presented at CHI um, coming up in Montreal. Uh, is one in which we used annotation as an act of interaction to help somebody use visualization to get into external resources that they may want to read. So annotation then being part of the cognitive process. And what, why I'm saying that is that we did a study of 14 poetry scholars, so PhD students and professors in poetry studies, who um, did two hours of annotation of poetry using their regular workflow, and we videoed them. And we did an ethnographic analysis of what it was that they were doing during this analysis, or during their, during their like, study of the poems. So uh, we looked at the types of marks they make, the parts of the page that they mark on, the um, timing of everything, and we did, did this using an Anoto pen and paper, and we printed a poem that they knew and a poem that they didn't know to try and see if there was any difference, and in fact, there wasn't. So uh, we found a few things, that they all have their own idiosyncratic way of making marks on the page, but in general, when marks are made in a spatiotemporal similar sequence, then those are usually related to one another. So underline, 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 underline might be counting syllables. Circle, circle, circle might be synonyms. But if you go circle, circle, underline, circle, the third circle is probably not related to the first two. So using that, and the fact that they all said they don't want and don't need external tools, we tried to come up with something that would fit into their workflow and not be disruptive. So there are several poetry visualizations available that are really neat from a visualization point of view, but they're not being taken up by people who do this kind of work because they don't want the work done for them. It doesn't, they say, we don't, I don't need something that takes a poem and counts the, the rhymes and gives me a visualization of the rhymes. 
um, because I know how to do that. And actually, through doing that, I learn about the poem. If you do it for me, I don't know what the poem's about anymore. I just know some statistics. So our tool then is based on what we call impl implicit interaction. So the annotation event that they normally do with a pen on the paper becomes input into a visualization algorithm that will show them things that they might have missed. So we're trying to infer what it is they're looking for based on the ac actions that they do, put it on a secondary display that they can look at if they want or ignore if they want until they're finished, and maybe then glance at and see, you know, what did the computer think I was doing here? But right now I'm just going to work on my own thing and ignore this secondary device. So um, we don't mind that we're getting false positives here. So for example, uh, we might cir they might circle three words and we see that we guess that they're synonyms and there's a fourth word that's also a synonym, but maybe in this particular context they don't think it is. If we show it to them, then they can consider it and dismiss it, right? These are experts. So here's an example of how it looks. So as you work on the page, um, you can print a poem, the system knows where the words are in the poem. Immediately you start seeing extra information appearing on the secondary display. So here the gray, gray, gray tiles are our definition tiles. These are related to the significant words that you underlined. Um, and then after a little bit of a delay, there's additional information that's brought in from external resources. And these might be things like the fact that both of these words are related to violence, so syn synonymous um, tiles. Uh, they also have, uh, if they have any kind of um, rhyming, and here what I learned also through this was that rhyming is way bigger than I ever thought in terms of what poets um, think. So there's consonants and assonants and a bunch of different types of rhymes um, that we're providing in, in the analysis. So we have a series of uh, what we call uh, visualization tiles that represent the results about the poem. So here is one that shows alliteration across the poem and it's uh, uh, there are two types of two, two collections of alliteration in this poem. And you can hover on the green dot or the pink dot to isolate the ones that you're interested in. And we would only show this if they've marked words that we detect have this alliteration relation. So there may be other types of alliteration also in this poem, but we're not showing them because they haven't started to mark them. So it's really supposed to be an, an augmentative thing rather than a replacement for their workflow. Other tiles we provided, so rhyming, um, visualization, synonym visualization. And what they got really excited about was this idea of being able to bring in external resources that they no longer have to go to their bookshelf to look things up or Google. So in this case, if they circle, for example, two uh, antonyms in one of Shakespeare's sonnets, we can show them the other Shakespearean sonnets that also contain that antonym pure yeah, yeah, yeah. right away. So they don't, don't have to search for it. So bridging into existing outside resources. Uh, Frank O'Marady calls this distant reading. And um, there's a lot of controversy in the digital humanities about this, but I think we're starting to do it right, which is to work it into the workflow rather than in place. So how do we do this kind of work? So we've got a bunch of different technologies that we're using on a regular basis. So as you've seen, tagging text, um, sometimes labeling who's speaking in the text, cleaning the data, structuring the data, indexing and linking it, and calculating scores about the terms. We use several different types of out, uh, open source technologies. We also contribute back to some of these projects. And um, we use a lot of different NLP resources. So everything from Corpora and docu uh, and uh, we've moved a lot more into doing things like word embedding, so word to vec, um, ex uh, outside data sources we use as a reference. Um, I mentioned today COCA and WordNet. So if you're interested in using any of these things and you want to know about them, just feel free to get in touch with me. I want to end with a bit of a caution. So. Uh, this comes from the passwords data set. One of the top 20 most common words in passwords given English as a reference was team. And we looked at this and thought, like, why, right? So maybe, and I don't know anything about sports, so like, maybe people are talking about their favorite team. And we thought, like, of course not, because like, they're not going to say the word team in their password. They're going to say J's, right? It's not, not going to be um, the word team. So what was it? <laughs> te amo, Luis. Jesus te amo, Carlos te amo. <laughs> So here we have, if you don't know, Spanish, I love you, with a male name. So it's actually, like, the caution, I guess, here is that there's an implicit assumption in our processing that people were making passwords in English. If it wasn't gibberish, it was English. And what we detected, of course, was not English, it was Spanish, and it was misdetected as English. So when we have these kind of visualizations, we need to be able to, we, we can't make conclusions based on the view. We need to drill down confirm the conclusions. These are hypothesis generating tools. Similarly, from Barbie, um, Barbie is not talking about artillery shells. 
<laughs> she says, I'm sure Chelsea would love to see your shell collection <laughs> sometime. She laughs. Shells are all she talks about right now. So um, we know that Barbie's not talking about shells. The system does not know, right? So some word sense disambiguation would be useful here, but that's actually really hard to achieve on this level of granularity. But certainly something we could do. Language is ambiguous. We can do, we can easily detect things like this, but not when they're out of context, like words in a password that might not have associated terms with them. It's a complex structure. We've got more and more and more data volume. So we, on one of the projects here, I talked about 242 million tweets. So how do we find, so one of the things I'm interested in now that we're focusing on in terms of a series of research projects that are just getting going, is helping people find a subset of data that they might want to use for their analysis. So. Um, Actually, with Fanny here, we're working on a project we're calling Data Tours. So given a large amount of data, how do we guide somebody to particular parts of the data that might be interesting for them to look at first before they start their analysis? So um, sort of helping bridge people into an analysis process. Um, I, I think there's also a case to be made for some vision science research meets, uh, meets information visualization around what, are the, what is the impact of these manipulations we're doing to text on legibility? So I've showed you curved text. I didn't show you this one, but it's like 3D, 3D rotated text, which actually I think um, there's been some research out of this group around that. Uh, and then changing the size. Uh, we can even change the backgrounds. We can add blurring effects. How does this affect how people are able to read the view? So I'm interested in that question. We just investigated the um, size reading uh, question in a paper that's coming out in TBCG this, uh, this year where we did an experiment looking at how accurately people can tell the difference between, um, the, like, choose which word is bigger when the size difference is really small. So basically, um, an experiment which looks at how uh, fragile are word clouds when the size gets too small. Uh, and also, what's the biasing effect of length? So as a preview, more people thought moreover was a bigger word than zoo, even though they're actually the same size, and it's a forced choice experiment. So. Um, I guess with that, I would just say, if you're making visualizations of language, please consider uh, always providing a link to the original underlying text, so the raw data, if possible. Um, I think it really is a powerful uh, technology, but it has to be used with knowledge about what it's useful for in terms of what the tasks that the people want to complete are. So the other thing, I guess, is that I haven't actually said um, any of these are for exploration. These were for specific targeted tasks for given populations of people. The techniques can be generalized, but none of them are just for open, like, oh, we're just interested in just exploring, right? These are, uh, I think, when we have targeted tasks and interesting things about the data that we want to question about, we can actually design techniques that are more powerful. So with that, thank you to my colleagues and collaborators, also the students who are mentioned here, the ones in bold are the people's work who I, that I showed, and uh, funding agencies, and also for Tex for having me. Thanks. We have time for a couple questions. Hi. The question is, uh, the password you mentioned that they, are, they were lab generated. They, they, they were procured from the lab. They were not procured from the real life situations. No, the passwords that we used were procured from real life situations. So these were passwords that were hacked by others and released online, and we downloaded them as soon as they were released online. So we have over 300 million different passwords from different data sets. Um, some of them are 100% released online, so the best one we have is from a website called RockU, which went defunct. The negative about, they, they were actually stored in plain text on the server and they were just taken. Okay. Um, the negative about that one is that they're, they're, the password creation rules were very lax, so they're sometimes very short, they sometimes contain only lowercase letters, that kind of thing, so they don't really represent passwords of today. The better ones we have from websites like Yahoo and LinkedIn are only partial releases because some of the more sophisticated passwords still haven't even been cracked from those data sets because they were, they were released as hashes. But we don't redistribute that data unless it's for research purposes. So we've had some agreements with other, other researchers where we've provided access to our data sets, but we don't make it available online. Oh, sorry, I was late, so you maybe mentioned this, and I noticed word to back mm -hmm. words were embedded. But have you experimented with your different architectures, deep architectures, LSTMs, and sequence to sequence models that have been newer? Uh, I haven't myself. One of my graduate students actually was really excited about this and just did an internship at Microsoft where he was looking at LSTM related visualizations. And I was able to sort of visit with them and collaborate slightly on that project. But I, it's an area of interest. 
Uh, I have a project right now where we're working with uh, SRI in the U.S. and uh, University of Guelph, Graham Taylor, who's a machine learning there. And we're working on, uh, it's under the DARPA Explainable Artificial Intelligence Initiative. And we're looking at movie question answering, actually, we're using the data set from, from U of T, from Sonia Fiddler's group, uh, on how do we do visual text analytics for that task and also maybe expose a little bit about what's going on in the deep learning model. So it's about sort of helping people trust whether or not the conclusion that's being um, derived is, is, is uh, trustable or, or not, so appropriate trust. But it's a brand new area for me. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, have you done any work in terms of attention spans and visualization in terms of actually drilling down into the data after seeing a visualization? Hmm. How that's changed? Attention span. Hmm. You mean like how people would get uh, bored with the view visualization task, like the analytics task, or? So comparing, I guess, if you're at the New York Times as compared to social media, your attention span and sort of attention uh, oh. to detail will be different. Yeah, I don't know if work in that area, but it would be interesting to see. We're looking, the only one that we're looking at that's somewhat related, I guess, is uh, we've, been, we've got a project going on right now where we're looking at frustration in analytic tasks. So we're actually um, hooking people up to different physiological monitors to, to see how frustrated they get during uh, an analytic task that we've constructed to be especially frustrating. And uh, the, the end goal, this is in the area of like um, mixed initiative analytics. So the end goal there is if we can detect people are frustrated, then maybe we can provide appropriate support or help. Um, that might be the time to say, here's a different view of the data that you might be interested in, or here's uh, some help with the interface that, you know, um, but as of, in terms of attention span, I haven't looked into that myself. So. Okay, we're, we're out of time, so uh, let's thank uh, Christopher one more time. <laughs> and this actually concludes the fall semester for the Tux Speaker Series, so we'll look forward to seeing everyone in the new year. Thanks. So thanks Bye. for your patience, too, with the technical problem. Yeah. <laughs>